Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Andrew. And I'm Rachel. And we are Picture the Scene Podcast. We are a true crime podcast aiming to put you, the listener, at the scene of the crime. We bring you a new episode on a weekly basis, mainly focusing on lesser known crimes from the UK and Ireland. However, at times we expand into cases from anywhere in the world and all ones that are well known. And today is one of those times. Ooh. As we are a true crime podcast, listener caution is always advised, so please keep this in mind. If you like what you hear, please do follow us on whatever social media platform you prefer, subscribe to us on your preferred podcast platform of choice, and if you have the capability, give us a rating and review as well. It really does mean the world to us, doesn't it, Rachel? It does. We absolutely love every rating and review we get. Exactly. I agree, Rachel. And if you like it that much that you want to support us, you can do so for less than the price of a cup of tea or coffee on Patreon. We've had lowest tier starting at £1 per month, and we release bonus content every month. The links to our social medias and Patreon can be found in the show notes, or visit patreon.com forward slash scene pod. That's p-a-t-i-o-n dot com forward slash scene pod. Or you can just Google patreon and picture the scene podcast and you'll find it that way as well we do where possible now release our episodes a week early for our patreon supporters so unlike matthew mcconaughey in interstellar you don't have to leave your family behind to hear us a week in advance all you have to do is support us on patreon i'm gonna have to take your word for it never watch that movie it's a classic classic Mm, sure it is so rachel how are you doing i'm good thanks how are you yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sparkling today. It's Friday, the sun is out, and life is just good at the moment, Rachel. So, yeah, I'm sparkling. What a response. What a great way to start recording so early on a Friday morning. <laughs> yes. But forget about how I'm doing. The more important question is, mm-hmm. are you ready for some true crime? I was born ready, Andrew, and I'm very excited because you alluded to doing a well-known case today. So bring it on. I am doing a well-known case. Boy, it's time I dip my toe into that arena. <laughs> Once you start, you won't go back. If it's safe for you to do so, I'd like you to relax. Close your eyes and picture the scene. Today, I'd like to take us back to Friday the 1st of March, 2019. And I want to focus on the evening. But before I do, let's go to the morning, Rachel. And it was not a normal morning in the Chesney house. It started a little bit unique and a little bit special. Jodie Chesney was at home and it was a special day in the house because it was Jodie's dad's birthday. So as he was getting ready for work, Jodie popped her head around the stairs in the home and said, Happy birthday, Dad. She also apologised to him because she said his present would arrive the next day in the post. And so she said, sorry, it was going to be late. He said, Yeah, he said, thanks, love. He gave her a kiss and he went off to work. Sadly, though, he would never see her alive again. Oh, no. That's, like, quite depressing. Yeah, so Jodie Chesney, she was 17 years old and she was studying psychology, sociology and photography at the nearby Avery Sixth Form. She was a kind, loving person who wore her heart on her sleeve and she loved her friends, family, and also she adored her, adored and loved her dog, Woody. And they all really did mean the world to her. She was so fun, Rachel. She laughed a lot. And she had that kind of laugh that when you heard it, it immediately cheered you up. Even if you didn't know why she was laughing, it lifted everyone's mood who could hear it, often causing people to stop laughing simply because she was You've got that type of laugh, Rachel, so that, that type of laugh. Oh, well, thanks for that. And it makes me really sad. Like, I don't yes. think I'm going to uh, enjoy this episode. Yeah, well, she, Jodie loved the colour purple. She often dyed her hair that colour, and she was always so busy, living her life to the maximum at every opportunity. She was an active scout member. She supported the younger beaver and cub sections and would often volunteer at the Scouts and many of her projects, such as the Great Runs 5K. So to care for others came naturally to her, Rachel, and it existed in every inch of her body. She'd already completed her bronze and silver Duke of Edinburgh awards 
and she was just a few weeks away from completing her gold, which, having done these as a child and failed them, I know it's quite an achievement to actually succeed. Absolutely. I actually quit after bronze. I, uh, yeah, I, I actually hadn't quite realised what I'd signed up for when I did the bronze. I remember the the, the trip, because you obviously have to go camping, don't you, and spend time away from home and navigate, like, wherever you live basically the hills and the you know all of that via compass and live like off the grid don't you really but um yeah I had no idea what I'd signed up for and uh pretty much moaned the whole time and when I got home I just cried in my mum's arms I was like never again yeah I never even completed the bronze I didn't even get that far yeah I did love the charity element like obviously you had to do some fundraising and there was lots of stuff to do in the community which I love anyway but yeah, that walking and camping, just that life is not for me, I'm afraid. Yeah, exactly. So so hats off to her that she did a bronze and a silver. She was just so close to finishing her gold. Absolutely. Well done. I'm also not really sure how she found the time because she would often also go around London and into her ever-growing photography portfolio because she loves to just take your photographs. And... I feel like 17-year-olds can or like young people in general can afford like less sleep definitely and they have just more energy to like bounce around from from thing to thing don't they yeah yeah i think you're probably right and but if all that wasn't enough she was also learning to play classical music on the piano something that her dad loved to listen to and would often ask her to play and yeah she was only 17 but sadly she would not live past the 1st of March 2019, her dad's birthday. She had not grow into the wonderful woman she was destined to become. And Jodie's dad, Peter, he described his daughter as a very proud geek. And I thought that was a very great description. The 1st of March, after her dad left for work, it was a pretty normal day for Jodie. She went to college. She never missed college because she was fiercely insistent on not hiding the fact that education was important to her and she wanted to do well. But college is also a time of having fun. And she had fun that day. She chatted with her friend Clarice about normal things teenagers chat about, makeup and some boots that Jodie had bought recently for herself. You know, normal teenage conversations. And stuff that, like, ordinarily you just wouldn't remember. But when you, obviously, if Clarice was, like, thinking back to the last ever conversation she had with her, that she'd be cherishing that, like, banter, wouldn't she? That, like, mindless chat about a new pair of boots. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Jodie, along with her best friend Clarice and her boyfriend Eddie, They'd arranged to meet other friends of theirs that evening in Amy's Park, which is in Howard's Hill in Romford in London, close to where they all lived. It was now a little after 9pm, around 9.20 to be exact. It was March, so the nights, while getting longer, still got dark pretty early, so by this time it was as dark as the night was going to get. To Jodie, her boyfriend and their friends, it was just another normal Friday night, enjoying each other's company. Someone had some music playing on their phone, nothing too loud, and they were all just having fun. They were smoking a little cannabis and getting a little high, but that's something that teenagers do at that age all around the world, isn't it? It it absolutely is, and, like, you can be, like, really clever, you can be really well-behaved, you can be, like, really social and really, you know, care about your image and your body and everything, but, like, let's be honest, if you haven't, done it you've tried it and I think it's like a rite of passage isn't it for for teenagers to um to smoke or you know or like have it in a cake or you know in some form of of um food and it's just yeah it's just like having your first beer every everyone's kind of done it and like it or low that uh it doesn't make her or her friends like less pe- less of a, like a human being or anything does it of course no not, judgment course here not. Of course not, and it had been dark since around half seven that evening, so almost two hours. So while all the eyes had adjusted to the darkness, it still quite obviously restricted what they could see and how far they could see. 
Jodie was sitting on a bench table and Eddie, her boyfriend, was facing her. From behind Jodie, Eddie saw movement. He wasn't sure what it was at first, but he saw something moving. After a minute or so, probably a little bit less, his eyes adjusted and he saw it was two figures emerging from the darkness towards them. Before anyone knew it, the two figures had approached them, and as quickly as it approached, they disappeared. Jody then let out a scream. Oh, God. Initially, her friends thought that the two figures were thieves, and they'd stolen Jody's bag. But sadly, it was more serious than that. And this is what Eddie had to say when giving evidence about what happened during a subsequent murder trial. She didn't know what had happened. We just thought they had stolen our bags. But then she started screaming continuously, very loud, and it lasted about two minutes straight. Then she began to faint. At this time, she was falling off the bench. What on earth? Like, what provoked these two individuals to approach a group of teenagers and and stab, well, I'm assuming it's a stab, and stab one of them? Like, this is crazy. Yeah, we'll get to that. But yeah, it's, it's that question is very important. After she had fallen off the bench and she was on the floor, it was only when Eddie shone his torch from his phone on Jodie's back did he realise how serious it was. Oh, the, the white lining from Jodie's coat was covered in blood and it was now dark, a deep dark red. Oh, what, yeah, what they didn't know was that Jodie had been stabbed, like you suspected, once in the back, and it was a wound so deep it was 18 centimetres deep. It was only actually millimetres from coming out the other side of her body. Oh and it, had, it had penetrated her right lung. That's that's what was causing all the bleeding and also it was causing her lung to fill with blood. What on earth possessed them? And like, how often do you hear it with, um, you know, comments from stab victims where they don't know they don't associate that they've been stabbed. They just know there's a pain, and um, and yeah, the the need obviously to to cry out. Um, but like their mind isn't working fast enough to process the fact that they've been yeah. stabbed because that's that's how fast it happens, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And when Jodie started screaming, a family in a house nearby heard her screaming, so the mum of the family ran out to try to help. As she reached a group of teenagers, they were all, as you'd imagine, Rachel, in a state of panic and shock. I, I was just about to say as well, in the middle of a London evening when it's dark, that's really brave of that mum, because how often do you hear again, you know, if someone's attacking you on the streets, you shout fire, you don't shout rape, you don't shout attack, knife, gun, nothing, you shout fire, because people will generally want to protect themselves not others so how brave of that woman yeah definitely definitely and she yeah she's very brave because she she put Jodie in the recovery position and one of Jodie's friends phoned emergency services but they, they was all really in shock and they didn't know what happened and he was talking to them but he was really in shock so he he passed the phone on to the woman the mother to speak to them as well the ambulance arrived at 9.30, 10 minutes later, 10 minutes after the attack, roughly. But by then, Jodie was so, showing no signs of life. They immediately started compressions on her, and they took her away to the hospital. So let me turn my attention back to Jodie's dad, Peter. If you remember, Rachel, it was his birthday. So he was off out with his brother and some friends at a central London bar called the Daisy Martini, oblivious to what was happening. And uh, while they were in the bar, his brother Dave got a phone call asking them where they were and to inform him and Peter as a consequence that Jody had been attacked and to stay where they were because police were on their way to pick him up to take him to Jody. And this is what Peter, Jody's dad, had to say. My brother got a phone call to say the police were on their way to pick me up because Jodie had been attacked. As you can imagine, I was in deep shock. One minute I'm laughing, the next minute Jodie had been attacked. When the police arrived, 
they picked up Dave and Peter and told him they'd be taking him just one short mile north to the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel to see Jodie. Sadly though, Rachel, Peter would never make it to the Royal London Hospital. He wouldn't make it because neither would Jodie. She died from her injuries. Doctors in the ambulance, in a desperate attempt to save Jodie's life, they performed emergency surgery on her way to the hospital, but she didn't make it. And she, um. was, yeah, she was pronounced dead at 10.26 on the forecourt of an SO garage in Gants Hill, Ilford. Peter, Jodie's dad, would later describe how he found out. I heard over the radio someone telling them to reroute to my house because Jodie had gone. At that moment, I just lost my composure and dropped on my knees. I cried all the way home. There and then, my life fell apart. She died, but there was no reason why she died. <laughs> he almost brought a tear to my eye every time I read that. Um, imagine that, Rachel. I can't. I can't. As a father, as a mother, as a, you know, a parent, like, you're one kind of thing in life is to protect your children and be there and you know when when they fall over when they knock themselves when they cry when they're scared like and and to be processing all of those emotions when your kid just should have been out with their pals and essentially by 10 20 probably be home and tucked up in bed safely like you know he, he's just had his whole world turned upside down and not even like a family liaison officer to calmly break the news to him but to hear that over a police radio in that moment must be awful like I, yeah I can't imagine yeah yeah exactly so so why did she die that's the question you asked a moment ago Rachel yeah like what why Jody and why such a brutal attack like I'm hoping so, you have answers and it's not just a random attack you don't know this case of Rachel? So loosely, yes. I remember being I remember it being in the news about the um forecourt of the petrol station. As soon as she said she never got to hospital, I could picture the images that were published of of um yeah, because like the doctors have been riding in a car and the ambulance um that was making it to the hospital said, you know, we're losing her. And so the doctors arranged to meet them at the nearest midpoint, which was a petrol station. I remember all that detail, but I don't remember about the specific case. Yeah, so I guess the question we have to then ask, if you don't know, is who were the two people that approached her? And why did they target Jodie? Because remember, she was someone that seemingly no one disliked. She was a scout. It's just not like she was like... um into classical music, you know, yeah. my business, just helping the community, like, and I, I, and as well, like, I mean, obviously you're going to go into how the police n- nailed down the suspects, but how on earth when there's no visual on them, just two dark figures, like, must have been some fine police work to find them. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll get there. But the closest Jody had gotten to anything criminal was a little Andre drinking and a smoking of a little weed, like we talked about it earlier. Nothing that yeah. tens of millions of other teenagers don't do every weekend around the world. Yeah, and all those children that she was with in the park, all the teenagers, they were doing the same, but it, this seemed a very targeted attack on Jodie. Yes. So that me introduce you to Svensson Ong Akwi, who was 18 at the time, Aaron Isaacs, who was 17, Manu Petrovich, who was 20, and also a 16-year-old boy whose name was withheld due to his age. All four would be arrested and eventually taken to court, charged with the murder of Jodie on that Friday evening on the 1st of March. All four would be not guilty, though. So let's look at them. Firstly, let's talk about the 16-year-old boy, because I can't tell you anything about him, obviously, because... Other than he was with the other three, given his name and details, they were withheld from the public, so obviously I'm not going to go into him because I can't. You don't, you don't hear that a lot these days, though, do you? And I mean, obviously you haven't told us what their sentencing was, but um, ordinarily, like, for instance, recently in the press, when 
um, an underage person has been found guilty of a crime, the judge usually like allows their name to be published. Yeah, if they got found guilty, Rachel. If yeah, so I won't I won't um, ruin that any further. Svensson, who was eighteen from Romford, which is the local area that we're in today, he was a drug dealer. Aaron Isaacs, the seventeen-year-old, was from the same area, and he was Svensson's runner, moving drugs about for him. Mind you, Petrovich. Now, I couldn't get an accurate location where he lived, but I believe it was local as well, like the first two, and he was also a drug dealer. Whatever I'm about to say or describe has been backed up by evidence, CCTV, witness evidence or otherwise, with the exception of one thing, the motive that's never been established. So at around 9pm, Manuel picked up the 16-year-old boy and then they drove to pick up Svensson and Aaron. They then drove to Amy's Park and pulled up. So this is actually how they found it, Rachel, because they got CCTV of the car and then they could trace the car back. You know, as, as they've done many times in the past, London's full of CCTV, so... Um, it's still clever, isn't it? Like, you yeah. know, the hours that they have to trawl through. And how, how quickly were they picked up by the police following the murder? I don't know exactly. I can't remember. I don't think I wrote it down, but it wasn't immediate, but it wasn't... Yeah massively long I, I can't remember I because saw again the officers that run through the cctv they can't just fast forward it they have to painstakingly watch it all before before we see the evidence piece together they've gone through like thousands of hours worth of footage haven't they and it's insane yeah yeah it's it's the concentration is wrong but but yeah so they drove to amy's park and they pulled up now, they pulled up in a position that was in between where Joe and the friends were and where the house where the woman from the family came in and out of to help. So that's the important part to remember, Rachel. So they basically drove in between the house and where the, where the kids were. When the car pulled up, Fenton and Aaron got out of the car and approached Jodie. When they approached Jordy Svensson stabbed her in the back once. The way that I described earlier. And then they both ran back to the car and drove away. So why did they kill Jody? Well, to start with, they all pled not guilty. And they all denied having any part in the murder. But it was thought that Svensson was not happy with a rival drug dealer that was selling drugs in his area. So he mistakenly assumed Jodie and her friends were the sellers. So he stabbed Jodie in retaliation for that. Oh, wow. So to me, this seems like the only plausible explanation, given he didn't know Jodie or her friends, and none of them were involved in anything criminal. However, not everyone agrees with that explanation. So I'll get I'll tell you later who doesn't agree with it. Okay. However, all four of them pled not guilty to murder. So let's look at their defence and the outcomes of all four, because the outcomes did differ. Svensson claimed that he knew nothing of Jodie's murder and that he'd been dropped off to sell some drugs to someone in the park. And it was Aaron who stabbed and killed Jodie. Aaron claimed he did not know Jodie was going to be stabbed and it was Svensson who stabbed her. Manuel and the sixteen-year-old said that they did know any did not know any crime was to take place, and that they'd simply taken the other two to the park. The CCTV would show that the sixteen-year-old stayed in the car, and Manuel only left the car to let the other two out before getting back in again. It also showed the car waiting with its doors open. They said that. Manuel and the 16 year old boy being they said that, that at no point did they know a crime had taken place either before or after, and they'd heard no screams. They said music in the car would have drowned out any screams. It was also argued, though, by the prosecution, that they knew exactly why they'd taken the two to the park because Svensson would have been holding a knife and they would have talked about it. So they were as culpable, just like Aaron and Svensson. 
and that if a family could hear Jody screaming from inside their house, because it was the son, the mother's son that heard it first, they were in the house, and he told his mum, and that's why she went running out. So if a family could hear Jody screaming inside a house, at a distance, the distance from where the teenagers were to the car, and the distance from the car to the house was two or three times longer than the distance from the car to the teenagers. So the distance from the teenagers to the house was even longer, and the how they heard it inside the house. So even with music playing, they argued, how could they not hear screams in the car? Yeah, and, then, and obviously they're running back to the car as well. Just the ignorance of the of the age, though, isn't it? Of like, oh, I was playing my music. I'm not going to listen out for screams. Like, I, I'm sorry, but if you're that age and you understand that something's going down, yeah, fair enough. You might not understand it's a murder, but you understand something's going down. You're curious. Who? Who? Yeah. Where? What? Like, when are we going to run? Your heart's probably pounding really fast. So, if anything, I, I reckon they don't have that radio on. They're listening out for the commotion to know that they're going to have to put their foot on the gas and, and get the hell out of there. Well, they were sat waiting with the car doors open so they can yeah. get them in quickly and get them away. Exactly. But... exactly. Don't don't come at your like defense argument being oh i was in the car the music was playing i had no idea somebody had been injured whatever yeah both manuel and the 16 year old would be found not guilty by a jury and they were free they were free to go wow that's why the 16 year old was never named and that's do you know what that's like again a shocker and obviously you you can't convict as a jury you can't convict without evidence can you so no. there's probably just a, a massive lack of evidence on their part but it wouldn't surprise me if that 16 year old and Manuel was it Manuel yeah yeah end up you know back in today their names in the press like you don't you're not involved in something like that without you know that being the the, the start of your life of crime or part yeah, of it sure. anyway you have to remember, Manuel was 20 and a drug dealer. Svensson was 18 and a drug dealer. Aaron was 17 and his runner. So I'm guessing, that I educated guess, the 16-year-old was probably Manuel's runner. Yeah. So, yeah, they were already involved in crime. Now, Svensson, you remember, he said he went there to sell drugs. But CCTV would footage would show him as he made his way towards Jody holding something that looked like a knife and that was reflecting light. He would say, though, that it was a light from his phone that he was holding, not from a knife. Additionally, he said that Aaron stabbed Jodie, but the friends of Jodie, including her boyfriend who testified in court, would say that it was a tall, dark-skinned teenager who stabbed Jodie. Now, Svensson was a tall, dark-skinned teenager, whereas Aaron was a short white teenager so finally the morning after the attack Svensson tried to throw away his iPhone and burn his clothes and trainers more proof the prosecution said showing that he was guilty along with the fight and this is clever please wait you'll like this Rachel they were able to prove that shortly before the attack Svensson actually turned his phone off which meant there couldn't have been a light showing on his phone if he was holding it. Yeah, clever. And like they, they look, they actively look out for that now, don't they? Yeah. People used to get away with with crimes because you know the mobile phone wasn't pinging off towers near the scene. But how often do we actually switch off? Unless the battery's gone, how often do we actually switch off? Our yeah, mobiles? exactly. It's good. No, brilliant. That doesn't mean that they were found guilty though. Oh. So after de- deliberating for six hours, both Svensson and Aaron would be found guilty of murder. Okay, good. Svensson would get life with a minimum term of 26 years, as it was deemed he stabbed Jody and Aaron would be deemed as culpable as he went with Svensson, so he received life with a minimum term of 18 years. Now, After the conviction, it would reveal that Svensson had previous convictions for dealing Class A drugs and possessing a weapon, a knife. Aaron's identity, and actually as an aside, um, when when they were arrested, 
Aaron was actually found with a bag with a knife in it. So he could never even learn from the fact that they just killed someone. He was still carrying a knife. It's Aaron's a bad there, isn't it? I guess. So yeah. Now, Aaron's identity was initially withheld due to his age, but the BBC applied for the Section 45 to be removed to reveal his identity, mm -hmm. something which Judge Wendy Joseph agreed with and revealed his identity. The judge gave this as the reason for removing that restriction. What is important is that a blameless girl is dead at the hands of those engaged in and those that associate with drug dealing on the streets, which Georgie and other blameless young people must live. This death has brought great unease in the community. Though suffering, which spreads much further than Georgie's friends and family, need and have a right to know and understand how this came about. So that's the reason why she gave as to be reading Aaron's name. Now, I try not to quote sens sentencing remarks too much, Rachel, because, but I feel this time the judge, Wendy Joseph, got so much spot on here that I want to read a few quotes from her when she sentenced the two. Aaron is referred to as a 17 year old because this was before she released his name. Okay. And this is what she said. Facts have emerged that Svensson Ongakui was a well-established drug dealer in Howard Hill and Collier Row areas of East London, dealing in cannabis and cocaine. The 17-year-old was his young associate and close companion. Now, the judge actively, this is why I said people disagreed with the reason why he stabbed Jody. The judge actively rejected the idea that Jody was mistaken for a rival drug dealer called Jade saying this the killing is far more sinister and dangerous than that she said that jody's murder was a planned attack and they mistook their target but she said what matters is that they left the area and prepared to attack and that is exactly what they did they came back to the park in the car of manuel petrovich he was asked to help because anger Kree was trusted him i reject that Svensson went back to his hostel to pick up two small bags of cannabis. One of you plunged a knife into Jodie's bag. She was talking to the two there. Now, one of you plunged a knife into Jodie's bag. Jodie screamed until she could scream no more. Svensson burned his clothes at night and the teenagers disposed of his too. It was part of a series of tit-for-tat attacks. So it was part of a series of tit-for-tat attacks Increasing in ferocity, which have carved up areas of this capital city into turf. Although the target was not Jody, Judge Joseph added, there was a degree of planning. I am satisfied, satisfied both defendants were prepared to carry out their attack. Svensson has a significant history of drug dealing. However, in this case, there is no history of violence. When that knife was driven into Jody, that intention was to kill. So, I mean, I really feel for Jodie's father, Peter, here, Rachel. And But what do you think about this case? What I think about most cases, it's just really senseless. Um, and I can see why you read the judge's sentencing remarks, because she has nailed it. And she's, like, taken all of the information from the team that are prosecuting and she's taken all the information from the defense and she's made the narrative that seems to me to be absolutely spot on they've gone out yes to target somebody to make an example of them and to show that you know their turf should not be messed with but this target is an innocent young victim and um you know e but even if even if they'd have got the um what did you say her name was jade the drug dealer that they were after yeah that's what the prosecution said but she said she doesn't think it was jade but it was probably a mistaken identity yeah but it, even if like they had have got this person that was like part of the other gang that that too would have been a senseless murder. Like, I don't believe that people deserve to die, like, regardless of how they make a living selling drugs, you know, they absolutely deserve to be 
um, to suffer the consequence of that and you know whether that's prison time or rehabilitation but no one deserves to die and, and this was just so malicious um they went out that night with intent um i take it they took the knife with them yes. uh, yeah and you know they've gone out of the way to burn the clothes to hide the knife clean it um knowing that they've taken a life yeah they never they never found the knife right but you're not you're not going to stab somebody that deep knowing that they're going to come out of that like alive or without life altering yeah that Um, force in the back as well yeah exactly it's just um foolish and um what's the word uh when you are um petty and weak and um chart and cowardice Uh, yeah cowardice absolutely in the back wouldn't even look them in the face um didn't approach didn't validate just crept up on a young girl in a park after dark like disgusting i think you've summed it up perfectly i'm gonna wrap this up then major if that's okay yeah this has been season three episode six called jody chesney i'm gonna ask you to relax and close your eyes but i'm not gonna ask you to picture the scene what i'd like you all to do is empty your minds and listen to a small bit of music jody doing something she loved doing playing the piano now the voice you can hear speaking is jody's dad peter so before I play, we'll just say goodbye to next week now. And I also won't play the theme music at the end because this music is good enough. So so thank you for listening. Enjoy this piece of wonderful music by a wonderful girl. And we'll we'll see you next week. That's a really touching tribute, Andrew. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Oh, I terribly miss being able to asked Jodie to play the piano for me. Um, I miss everything about her. Hmm.